what I want to share with you is some generative AI at home. So one of my more popular videos on the channel has been the GPT for all software application, showing you how to use that and leverage the local docs feature set. It's been a few months since I've talked about the open source alternatives to the likes of ChatGPT and Bard. And so I thought now would be a great opportunity for us to kind of come back and talk a little bit more about these open choices that we have for running on a local computer. You know, there's so many cool things that are going on in the space right now. I think it bears sharing some, some closer details. So let's take a look. First, I want to I want to go into and and just share with you briefly. Here's a couple of things that we're going to talk about in today's discussion. We're going to cover the types of applications that we can use that run on a local system, where you can find them, how to run them on your own system, and then I want to talk a little bit about where I think this is going over the long term, and that's really going to be much more free thought, not not a guided slide. So. Let's just dive into a couple of things here. First off, part of what got me thinking about this open source LLMs as the future and the reason why I felt we needed to have an update today is that uh, it was only about a week ago that Mark Zuckerberg came out and talked about some of the things that are happening. And without watching the Instagram video, which I could play for you, but the gist of the conversation is Meta is spending an incredible amount of money acquiring hardware that can build these large language models. More interestingly, though, with all of the money that it takes to build these open source models, Meta is actually pledging that Llama 3 that they are training today using these H100 GPUs, that is the uh, graphic processing unit that is most often used to build these large language models. They have hundreds of thousands of them to build the models. And they introduced Llama last year. That became an open source capability. Llama 2 has been released. That also is open. And Llama 3 will continue those efforts. So Llama 3 is going to be an open source large language model that anyone will, will be able to use and take advantage of. And so this is not going away. And in fact, uh, there was some discussion last year, Google actually released, uh, not intentionally, some internal communications that really showed that generative AI was not a moat capable technology. That is to say, nothing about building large language models and making them available is going to be unique to Google. And the cat is already out of the bag. The, the genie is out of the bottle. These large language models are a thing. There are open uh, models that are available, and anyone can grab these and build on top of them. So as we continue this evolution of all of the model development, there's big news that comes out on a regular basis as well. Brand new open things. So here's a good example. The DeepMind Alpha Geometry. So this was kind of a cool announcement that came out earlier this week that they have been able to solve complex geometry problems using alpha geometry. And once again, this is an open source model. So not only are, I mean, there are two really cool things in this story. The first is not only were they able to solve geometry problems with a large language model, they were able to use 100% 100, 100 synthetic data to do it. And it's available to anyone. You can go out there and get it, start playing with it. Uh, wow. I mean, there's some really amazing things happening here. So don't dismiss that these open models are going to be a big thing. But what what can you and I use them for? And I think this is really where I want to start the conversation because I've constantly been sharing the sort of things that matter about using generative AI. And the reality is whether you run it on your local computer or you're using some service elsewhere, we're looking at a number of key use cases and applications of these tools. And look, it largely hasn't changed since we started playing with them last year. There's all sorts of incredible things that can be put together with text generation, whether that's writing prose, whether that's learning about things, whether that is simply getting rid of the lorem ipsum. For me, the number one use case is eliminating 
writer's block. It's helping you get started. And the same really goes in terms of image and video generation. It gives you something to start with. You can have an idea. And with just a few words in a prompt, you can have a full color, really deep and interesting illustration like the one that you see behind me. This is more generative art. Uh, this came out of Mid Journey and just kind of playing around with things to put on my desktop display to have something interesting to look at on the desktop. This is one I generated a while back, and I thought it would be fun as a backdrop for the discussion today because hey, all sorts of wonderful creativity that comes out of this. This is really more inspired by space. This idea of being on the beach in a, in a foreign world seemed kind of interesting, right? Building a habitat. But anyway, there's a few more that are becoming more interesting. Music generation has really become an interesting use case, uh, you know, there's so much music that's out there. And, you know, if you're like me and you're creating content, you, you sometimes want to have music to put behind your content. Well, now it's actually possible to generate the music that sits behind it. So if you know what you want, you can simply go out and have that be generated instead of having to be concerned about a takedown notice because you used something that was copyrighted. And, uh, there's some pretty interesting applications of this, and we'll come back to that here in a little bit as we go through some of the things that you can use this technology for. I'll show you some demos of things that actually run on my own computer that I've been playing with, so you get to see a little bit how I explore and learn about all of the tools that are available. Scientific discovery is not to be undersold in terms of being able to find new things. You know, one of the challenges that we have today is uh, we have a lot of legislation and law around what can be done in the healthcare space. And I think what we're going to see a pretty dramatic explosion of over the next couple of years is patient data being plugged into a private system to identify uh, patient problems, um, help to prescribe medication, help to diagnose uh, conditions. Uh, I went to a really uh, fantastic presentation this week. We had a meetup uh, in downtown Dallas, and uh, one of the gentlemen there actually shared with us some of the work that he was able to do around uh, understanding uh, information from the human body around uh, our T cells and B cells, the antibodies and how they respond to different kinds of diseases, what's activated in some patients and not activated in others, really trying to use machine learning and AI technology to diagnose and improve the diagnosis or the identification of disease uh, for people. And I think there's really a huge, huge opportunity. But the example I have on the screen here is you, the, the system called GNOME that, again, was developed by Google DeepMind, this team is doing some pretty incredible work. Uh, and a lot of it is not being kept inside of Google. So I think there's some really, a lot of credit is due to the Google DeepMind team because they're doing fantastic work and they're not keeping it a secret. They're sharing what they're learning, which is absolutely amazing. But this GNOME system basically found 2.2 million new hypothetical materials and then they used a series of conditions to kind of narrow that down. But when everything was all said and done, we're talking about they identified stable materials, 48,000 of them that they're going to go and learn more about. And material science is a really complicated thing. I can't possibly pretend to know that. But right now, I've actually got the 3D printer running right now. And all of the new filaments that go into the 3D printer really come out of this material science, being able to take a, a medium and heat it up and squeeze it out through a nozzle to build a physical object is something that is cutting edge in so many ways. And finding these materials that work well in all sorts of situations is a critical part of that discovery process. So there are so many applications and I'm, we're, look, we are very, very minorly scratching the surface here, but what can you do with it at home? And I really think that all of these are applicable for you at home because there may be things that you want to learn about and you have information you want to protect. You don't want to have to worry about that going out to a cloud service. But I mean, let's just say you, you want to do some writing. Maybe you've got a book 
that you've been thinking about for ages and you've just been dragging your feet because it's such an enormous effort. Well, now you can actually begin that process. You, Here's the reality. I'm in that boat too. I've said uh, for quite some time, I'm going to write a book and I'm all of my excuses <laughs> are being taken away uh, because it's just becoming so much easier to do that. You know, you just, it, maybe you need an outline to start. Maybe you need to collect your thoughts and get them more organized. You know, we, we, we're far from the days of movable type where it was a pain to get something printed. Heck, we've got print on demand now. So all you have to do is create a digital version of it and then you're published. So that's definitely something that's on my to-do list in the near term. So I am using Journey of AI to think about what it is that I want to say and figure out the structure of that looking at what other people have done and trying to get summaries and understand what did they do and how did they do it is a part of that discovery process for me. And then finding inspiration, you know, visual art uh, tools like Dolly and others, I, I've been using excessively. But, you know, we talk about Dolly because it's part of chat GPT now. But what I'm going to show you later in the broadcast is there are open source alternatives. And I got my start with generative art using stable diffusion which was open sourced um, and i had a couple of graphics processor units on my local computer my desktop computers that i have here with me in my little laboratory uh, i had gpus that i was using to mine cryptocurrency because that was the the thing that i was doing at the time the uh, ethereum blockchain has moved on to other technologies uh, they moved away from uh from the technology that was very high compute required. So I had GPUs that uh, I was no longer using all the time. And ever since this generative art capability came out, I've been using those to create with the local computer. So I really don't even need a service like ChatGPT to generate art because stable diffusion. So I'll show you that a little bit later. Music creation is the same thing. This is another area where Meta's done some really interesting work, and they're sharing what they're discovering with the world. Uh, one of the models that uh, I'll show you with music a little bit later is theirs. We've got content personalization, you know, thinking about building things that are attached to your own personal tastes. You know, many of us are familiar with online services like Netflix that let you browse their catalog and you can watch on demand whatever show you want to watch. Well, they have a they have a feedback mechanism on Netflix that let you that lets you say I loved this, I liked this, or I didn't like it, and they'll use those inputs to recommend the next thing for you to watch. Well, you can use generative AI for this purpose, and let's say that you secretly love a film and you you just don't want to go on Netflix and tell them that you loved it. Well, now you can actually take and build your own personal list on your own personal computer, run it through generative AI, and say what would you recommend? Because a lot of these large language models have a corpus of information that comes from the internet that reveals all sorts of current pop culture things. And so that's a place where you can begin to use these models. You know, I'm sure that there, that we all have sort of information that we're just not comfortable putting out there online. I use uh, cloud backup for my files because I need them to be in an external location, but all of that is encrypted with the key that I can see. So my information is protected so that I don't have to be so uh, concerned about cloud services being compromised. But look, I, I use pretty much all of the services in different ways, but I don't have all of the files on any of the services. That works for me, but other people have uh, information that they're concerned about getting out and they want to protect. And you can do that by running it locally. So anything that's personal, whether that's your health data, whether that's you know, maybe you keep a journal and you have your most private thoughts in that journal, but you want to mine that for information. I keep a daily running log of things. I've got a, a Kindle device that I use all the time, pretty much every day to write notes and being able to mine the information, my thoughts and ideas uh, is pretty valuable, but I don't really want to put that out just anywhere. Uh, I want to, I want to protect it. So that's a good use case for me. And then of course there's, there's productivity. Look, anytime you're doing any kind of writing, you're doing correspondence. If you can save a few minutes by having the computer help you with that, why wouldn't you do that? And if you can do it locally versus having to pay someone a monthly subscription fee, I mean, look, I've had pretty 
good hardware at home for a long time, pretty much in perpetuity, because there's always some game I want to play or there's some new technology I want to use. Today, it's AI applications. So I have a couple of GPUs. We're not talking about the latest and greatest. I'm not buying H100s from an NVIDIA and spending tens of thousands of dollars on a single card. But look, if I've got a fairly recent GPU, and you probably do as well, why not use that to do something fun or useful? So let's let's keep going. I think there's some interesting things that you need to understand. You know, in terms of looking forward, and we'll come back to this later, but I I, I want to give you some additional ways to think about these large language models. And I've seen this in a few different places. I went looking for maybe where the idea came from today, and this is what I came up with. There was a paper that came out all the way back in 2006 by these fellows at Stanford, and they titled the paper Compression Through Language Modeling. And essentially, this is where the idea came through that a large language model could actually be a form of compression. And one of the predictions I made in the newsletter last month, and by the way, if you aren't signed up for the newsletter, go ahead and hit that link in the comments. Sign up for the newsletter. I got another edition here coming out in just a day or two, almost done putting that together. Uh, but the prediction I made was that by the end of 2024, we were going to have a proliferation a standard setup for running a large language model on a mobile device like an iPhone or an Android. Yes, all of these things are available through internet, but let's just be honest, okay? The internet, while it's supposed to be ubiquitous and available everywhere, still isn't. There are all sorts of things that cause interruption in connectivity. And this idea of a language model as compression is basically allowing us to take the entirety of the data stored on the internet and put it into a large language model. And we're talking about gigabytes of storage instead of terabytes or petabytes of storage. And then you can carry that information around with you because these language models are taking an incredible amount of text and packing it into a model that is in some cases uh, less than a gigabyte in size there are more and more internet devices that are beginning to take advantage of these capabilities. And look, I mean, we, we've got, this is a, a, a solid state disk that came out of a laptop. You know, these things keep getting smaller and smaller. So it takes less and less physical space. And, you know, this is, this is nearly a quarter of a, of a terabyte on just this size. And this is years old. Uh, the format gets smaller and smaller. And so we're going to see mobile devices that include a chip that stores the entirety of a large language model on a chip. And then you can just access that from anywhere. So we're going to see more of those solutions come out over the next year. And then some, I really think, if I'm honest, it's going to be the size of a watch. Um, I, I expect that Apple's going to do some things. They'll probably embed a lot of this intelligence into their next version of the watch. So look for that because it's making new things possible like never before. But let's talk a little bit about how we can build a discovery mechanism and learn about some of the models and start playing with them. There's kind of a combination of things here that I'm sharing with you. So first is Number one on my list today is LM Studio because it lets you choose virtually any model. Uh, and I'll show you some sources of models that you can use to identify what models you might want to try out. But LM Studio has been a tool that I've been using here lately to quickly get access to the new models and start working with them right away. Now, I'm not benchmarking these. I'm not running you know, a battery of tests to figure out how good the model is. I am relying on others to do that, but it is interesting to get your hands dirty and actually play with the model a little bit, ask it some questions, see how quick the token generation is. And like I said, I don't have the fastest, most modern GPU setup. So you know, my experience with it is gonna be fairly average, probably a little bit above average because the equipment I have is only a few years old. I think uh, I did the refresh of all of my equipment here in 2020, new hard drives and motherboards and graphics cards. Um, and I tend to buy the most efficient stuff because it runs 24-7, 365. But uh, LM Studio is 
uh, it's something I'll show you as we go through the talk today. Stable diffusion, as I mentioned before, that is what got me into generative AI to a significant degree when stable diffusion released their um, stable, sorry, when stability AI released their stable diffusion model as an open source capability. I had seen Dolly through open AI, but that was something that was very limited and you had to pay for. And I love the idea of being able to do this all day long, iterating and changing things. And some really cool things came out of my experimentation with that. Then as if you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you've seen my video on GPT for all that also lets you run models locally. They've done a lot of additional work with this tool. It absolutely has a place in the portfolio. And the place today is it uses something called RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation. Essentially, when we talk about this concept of Retrieval Augmented Generation, what we're talking about is you can provide it a series of documents and it will create an index of sorts that allows it to use those documents in answering questions. It's not the same as what you might see when you upload a PDF and summarize it. It's a different kind of mechanism. Uh, so it, it's not equivalent to, uh, say, like a Lang chain with a vector database that put, that's put on top of it. But Local Docs does have some great capability in it. So totally something that should be on your radar that you should be aware of, especially if you have documents that you want to go through go through. I think there are more solutions coming to this problem, but so far local docs works really well and um, it's been very usable for me. Now, number four here on the list is how I keep up with the latest and greatest in AI projects. I've learned more from having a, a one-click install in Pinocchio than from a lot of other places because it really provides me with three things. One, it's a one-click install. So I, if I see something about a new project, a lot of times uh, there's there's a fellow out on uh, X Twitter uh, called Cocktail Peanut, and he's the guy that's behind this Pinocchio, or that's the, the account behind Pinocchio. Really cool. So I'll show that to you as we go through here as well. So LM Studio is the first on the list, and uh, I threw in a screenshot of it here just so you could see it. But essentially, this is a chatbot interface, and you can go out and download the model and it will load that model into your memory and it will use your CPU and your GPU for you to interact with the model. Essentially, they make it stupid simple for loading this and being able to use it right away. It is about as pain-free as it possibly could be. I really like this tool and it's, it's really something that uh, I'm excited about because I don't have to wait very long for these things to become available. And what's really great here is you can actually not only download, but you can search for the results of these models. So if you hear someone talking about a new model, most often you can go in here and they will help you find it. So if you're not aware from previous videos and discussions, uh, Microsoft has this model called Phi. And they've updated Phi now to version Phi 2. And golly, this is already 45 days old. Um, and there are new models that are coming out all of the time. This is not something that is easy to keep up with. Uh, Mistral's doing a lot of great work. Uh, but what's really great here is that it is using the Hugging Face Hub behind the scenes. They're getting you the listings of a given model. And this uh, account, the bloke, is where someone is actually taking these models and they are turning them into something that you can run on your local system. I'm not going to go into the details and explain how this works right now. But what you do need to know is that, that what's happening behind the scenes is a quantization and different systems are going to have different levels of quantization that you'll want to use. The key here is you're really going to be looking at the size of the model. And, you know, the the quantization basically allows the size to get smaller and smaller. So if you don't have a ton of memory in your system, you're going to want to choose a quantization that is a lower number 
I tend to choose uh, something that's right in the middle because I have a lot of memory on my primary system here. So I can get a larger model because I have more memory to work with. But look, if you've got a smaller system, just choose the smallest one that you can. You're going to get some good results out of playing with that. And you're going to learn in interacting with it no matter what anyway. And it keeps your AI chats there. And then it's got a storage. You can see the models that I've been able to download and play with. And look, I'm not playing with this stuff every day, but when I want to look at the latest model, I can quickly get a hold of it and start working with it. And then it saves my chat. So totally recommend it. It also tells you, you know, how much you've got. You can tell it where you want to store everything. So a really fantastic tool that I would completely recommend. You can access uh, this. They've also got, uh, not only do they have their lmstudio.ai where you can download it, but you can follow them on Twitter. Of course, they've got a GitHub and a Discord. So if you're trying to figure out how something works or provide feedback to the team, there are multiple ways that you can take advantage of that and, and do so. All right, so let's, uh, let's keep going here. I'll jump back into the presentation. Let's talk about the next one. So Stable Diffusion, and if you've been with me on the channel for any period of time, you've seen this image before. This was one of my early experiments in trying to understand what we could do with generative art. And this is, I asked it to give me a picture of a barn in a, in a, a farm and an abundant location. Really amazing. And this is, this is old. Like this is not super cutting edge. If you look closely, right, you can see details that give it away that it's generated, right? And this is one of the things that in starting AI mistakes, I want people to become more familiar with how the technology works because there are three important aspects to this. One, don't be afraid of making mistakes, right? Just pick up the technology and start playing with it. That's the only way you're going to understand how it's useful. Two, we're in a world where this technology is going to get used by other people. And the more readily you can identify key attributes to these tools and what they what they're capable of and being able to spot fakes. You know, there was a discussion. Uh, I think it was last year. There was a, a picture that was posted on social media that was of an explosion supposedly near the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and that was a that was an AI generated image. If you were familiar with the sort of artifacts and lack of detail that you get out of these generative art capabilities, you might have been able to more quickly identify that that was a fake image. So it makes you less susceptible to the fakery. Uh, and then the third dimension, of course, is today the technology is as lacking in functionality as it will ever be. In other words, it's the worst it will ever be. This is only going to get better. I do think that at some point in the future, you will not be able to easily distinguish a generated image from a real one. And that's not really a new problem, right? We, we've been faking things for a long time. In fact, we love to be told stories. We love to see things that are fake. We go to the movies all the time. The movie business is the business of faking reality and making it believable. So that problem is not going away. It's going to proliferate, and we need to be more aware of what that might look like. So having some practice and familiarity with that is, I think, really important and not to be discounted. But how do you know what's what? You know, we talk about all of these models are available. You can go download Stable Diffusion. There are multiple versions of Stable Diffusion. There are new programs that are coming out all of the time. What matters? What's important? Well, there's a couple of places you can go to learn. The first is there is a local LLM comparison collaboration uh, in this repo that you can visit. And they're actually scoring them. So you could take a look and um, actually on... Uh, well, GitHub's not working with my presentation here, so I'll have to see if I can copy that link and open it in a new tab here. Here we go. They actually have all of these are in the repo and they're constantly updating the details so they can give you an output. These are all from November of last year and December of last year. I think we're going to see more and more. If you get toward the bottom, now we're into, into the 
results that are added here. Mixtral is the one that everyone seems to be talking about of late. But you can actually see the scores and understand how these uh, are evolving, which ones you need to pay attention to. That's one mechanism you can use. And then there is LMSYS, which is a chatbot arena. They're actually comparing these models in a more structured way. And it includes the proprietary and the open. So if you want to know who's doing really well, this uh, arena.lmsys.org is a great resource because you can quickly see how things are going. And if you look at it today, uh, it looks like Google's release of Gemini Pro is really moving up the ranks. They're number two. Uh, I was uh, roaming around X earlier today, and I think someone was talking about how it was beating GPT-4. Um, I don't know what's going on with that GPT-4 Turbo. Maybe is, that could be a new result that was posted today as a result of BARD moving up. But look, you've got a lot of different results here. And this is interesting because... What we're looking at is if you look at the top eight, Mixtral is number eight, and it is the first open model that's available. And it is better than some of the proprietary models that are available through the likes of Google, OpenAI, and Anthropic. And those are the three companies that we've been talking about most often when we talk about capabilities like ChatGPT and Perplexity. I use perplexity.ai all the time for research, and I'm constantly toggling between OpenAI's GPT-4 and Anthropic's Claude 2.1 for the output and the model generation. So, you know, look, if you're using Mixtral, you're at an equivalent level of competence in terms of the chatbot arena results. Now, what this means is that it's sort of a blind test. So these two models are pitted against each other and a human decides which output they think is better. So is this to a degree that, uh, you know, it really is better? Well, it's a human preference vote. Okay, so how much is that worth? But I think that, look, we've been training this thing for quite some time. So human input matters. I think these listings are relevant. And you should keep in mind that they're going to continue to get better and better. This isn't an open and closed book for the likes of open AI. There's more to come and uh, definitely something that you should keep an eye on and be aware of, particularly if you're interested in doing things only locally. As I was mentioning, Mistral, you know, they, they have done some tremendous work. This is a French startup company um, and they, really have come a long way with this idea of a mixture of experts. And this isn't a new idea in the AI space, but as far as I know, they were the first to put it in an open capability. They've created eight expert subnets, and then they sort of tie them together in order for the results to come out. And they're getting some pretty dramatic outputs with this capability and um, here you see it runs on consumer GPUs after quantization to four bits. Um, that's what I'm doing with the local system. Really the only difference between running this on an A100 or a, a local GPU like you and I would have in a desktop computer or a laptop computer is how fast it can do the token generation. It's just gonna take longer on your own system. And, you know, there's been days uh, certainly where I've been using ChatGPT and other tools where I've given it a pretty complicated prompt and I'm not sitting there watching it kick the results out anyway. I'll, I'll go to another tab and work on something else while it's generating the results. I will say, though, that probably the biggest vulnerability or lack of functionality that you'll come across in running, lo running it locally on your system is that you are limited from a memory standpoint. And if you are building a really sophisticated prompt, um, I've had situations where I've submitted a prompt and never got an answer back. So just be aware that if you're doing the more complicated prompts, that's probably going to be a little bit more of a challenge running that on your local system. But if we're going to get to the level of having a mobile device that runs it, and you think that that's a premier use case for your needs, it's probably not a bad idea to get familiar with these models so you can start to understand what they're capable of 
you know, we've got, we know Apple's going to do some sort of development with large language models later this year. We've already seen uh, Meta has released uh, their glasses that include the model on the glasses. Uh, the, you know, I haven't had a chance to play with that tech yet, but I think that's going to get better and better. And we're going to see more and more interesting things in that space. As I said earlier, right, it is easier to do this than you think. And you don't have to get it from a source like me, but here's an example. GPT for all did an update that allowed you to start using your GPU to work with the model. So that's continued to evolve. But also understand that if you don't have a GPU in your computer, there are ways to run these purely with CPU. There are so many optimizations that are going on right now. It's kind of getting to the point where a couple of these GPT for all videos that I've done are old enough that they seem slow compared to what's possible today because there's constant optimization. There's optimization in the hardware and the compute that run the models faster, but also the algorithms and the methods that are used for doing the token generation. There's lots of opportunity for optimization and it's going to get better and better. So don't dismiss it today because it's slow. Understand that it's going to continue to get better. And sometimes these improvements come in leaps and bounds. So if you think this might have relevance to your need, you know, it doesn't hurt to take a look. And of course, I'd love to hear from you if you've got something that you are interested in. Let's talk about it. I wanted to throw in another quick anecdote here. Uh, there's a lot of organizations and people that are really interested in doing fine tuning of models. Um, in looking through the job listings for generative AI capabilities, that is something I see a lot. They're looking for five and 10 years of experience in machine learning, and they want someone that can train and improve models. But I also want to emphasize, for those of you out there that are interested in the concept of prompt engineering, here is a paper that basically shows you can get an improvement in the result just by doing prompt engineering. Now, that may be uh, true, certainly with a tool like ChatGPT4, where they're throwing lots of compute at it. What does this mean from a local language model install? That's a little harder for me to tell, but don't dismiss playing with these larger models on your own system and using prompts to get good quality answers. I really think that uh, before the year is out, I will have built some sort of a locally run installation that makes this capability available on my website versus paying for an API connection to a chat GPT. Just for experimental purposes, I think it's kind of fun. Uh, incidentally, uh, and I didn't put this in the presentation, but I'm just, just thinking about it now. You know, I, I talk about perplexity a lot because it's a favorite of mine. It's not something that anyone else has to do. But what, I, what I've learned is that there is a, a lab option on Perplexity. So you can go to labs.perplexity.com. And one of the cool things that Perplexity has done is they've actually made these more popular models available on their labs playground. So you can actually go out here and grab Mixtral 8X 7B Instruct you don't have to do anything to run it on your local system and you can interact with it. So if you just want to play with it and get a feel for it, you can use somebody else's GPU for free. A lot of a lot of sources are making these things available just to really contribute to the community and the growth of the industry. So uh, kudos to Perplexity for doing that. I think that's very cool. And of course, this works on a mobile device. So that's where I'm most often using these local models. So if I want to, you know, while I'm out running around, get some hands-on keyboard time with it, I can do that through the playground. But uh, going back to the presentation, you know, what's interesting is the, uh, the development of these tools continues to identify new ways that we can work. And uh, there's, there's new research papers that are coming out all the time that we can learn from. And I think the key thing for us is just to recognize that there are all sorts of ways that we can use these tools and integrate them into what we're already doing in a seamless way. So before I before I go into the, the couple of 
really cool things that we get with Pinocchio. Let me just wrap things up quickly here. In terms of using generative AI at home, here are the big things that you need to consider. What is something personal that you want to do that you want to keep local or maybe not pay for a service? What is uh, the, What kind of information do you want to carry with you all the time? That's a use case and scenario. And then integrating it for you. You know, if you're not a programmer and you're not wanting to pull up and use APIs and these no-code development tools that you have to pay for a subscription for, it's probably going to be easier for you to write some things that integrate into the systems that you're already using and just run it locally, right? If you're copy and pasting documents, you can do that all locally. So don't hesitate to try things out with these local tools if you have a decent GPU, because there's a lot of cool things that can happen. Okay, now let me let me jump into a couple of critical anecdotes here. I've hit the end of the presentation. Look, there are so many models that are available, right? If you go to Hugging Face, they have just pages and page, look, 16,000 pages of results. There are more models than you can shake a stick at, and they do all sorts of different things. You have Stability AI Stable Diffusion and lots of different incantations of Stable Diffusion. You have derivations of Stable Diffusion. You have open source, right? We talked about Microsoft Phi. We talked about Mixtral. There are just so many models that are available. You could also start thinking about what is it that you want to do? The one that I'm playing with more likely lately is Tiny Llama because I'm interested in being able to put it on a small device and carry it around with you. So those are the ones that I'm going to be playing with. And you can learn about all of those models through Hugging Face. So, you know, just be aware of that. And then another one that I found out just a couple of days ago, one of the newsletters that I read, the the gentleman that writes the newsletter shared that uh, this was a tool he was using. Um, and I haven't even tried it yet. This is a, a lot like LM Studio, it looks like. And um, it's got some other uh, controls and options. You can play with the parameters. It's a little bit of a different interface. So I, I've got to play with this one before I can fully recommend it. But just because I haven't recommended it doesn't mean there are not other alternatives and options that are available to you out on the great wide internet. Um, but I, I mentioned GPT for all. Um, I'm not going to bring that up today because for some reason my installation is not cooperating today. I haven't been able to run GPT for all today but you can visit their website and install that. It's available for a lot of different platforms. And one of the cool things about GPT for all is you can actually build it locally, have it run the model, and you can interact with it using Python. So you can set it up as sort of like a lo local API endpoint if you want a development environment to play with without having to pay for any hosting or sign up for online services that require a charge. Okay, so I, I brought up LM Studio. That one was was pretty interesting and cool. But now the part I really want to show you uh, that I'm constantly using, that I'm really excited about, is this amazing tool called Pinocchio. And uh, I can't take credit for this. I actually found this through another AI YouTuber. Um, and uh, he's got all sorts of uh, great content he's sharing. As soon as he shared Pinocchio, I knew this was something that I needed to put my hands on. And you can see here that I've got quite a lot of projects that are installed. And uh, I'm not using all of these. But again, a lot of these I'm, I'm just playing with and learning. Um, the Whisper Web UI is neat because it lets me easily interface with the Whisper API that is available through OpenAI. So not all of these projects are intended to be offline, but almost all of them are open source. I think Wisp, the Whisper Web UI is the one exception that I know of. But Stable Diffusion will make images and it will create videos. So I downloaded this project and actually generated some video. Now, there are some downsides to this. So in the case of Stable Video Diffusion, for me, because I have an older system, it takes hours and hours to generate something. So I'm not doing that all the time, but this uh, baklava was really fun because I installed it without really fully understanding what it was. I knew it was a, a, a video intake model. This is sort of like the video version of Llama, 
where it basically connects to the camera and it is able to describe what it sees through the camera. So when I downloaded this and started playing with it, uh, in the text interface, it actually said uh, a man is sitting with his uh, holding his chin. He looks like he's deeply invested in whatever he's looking at. Well, that was me trying to figure out what the app was doing, and it had turned on the camera and was describing me sitting there with my hand on my chin. I'm not going to demonstrate this for you now because I'm using the camera to do the the live broadcast right now. But that was a really cool one that I really had fun playing with. Uh, comfy UI is a way to build user interfaces, but here's the cool thing. One click, you go to discover and they have all of these projects that are published. And so basically you can pick up one of these projects and click into it. And in a few minutes, it has downloaded that project and made it available. Now there's a few, there's a couple more clicks that you have to do to make it fully available. But once you go into one of these, um, it it gives you a few options. So you have to install it first. And this is one that I've actually installed. So if I start it, and hopefully this doesn't just totally take down my PC while I'm trying to do a live broadcast. I've got enough memory, I think, that I can get away with doing this. What it's doing is it, it's already downloaded and installed the project. And the the people behind Pinocchio have packaged this up so that it will run. So basically, all I have to do is click run, and it's going to go through and run the necessary steps to activate that app and get it running on my computer. And you see here, now it has already created a local endpoint that I can talk to. Um, so it knows where I am, and um, I'll have to bring the tab over. So you can see the interface, but this is the interface for the meta music generation. And so they've got an example in here for us to look at. Um, they've got the input text default value is an 80s electronics track with melodic synthesizers, a catchy beat and a groovy bass. I'm just I'm not even going to play with the options here just as I want you to see it real quick. And what it's going to do. When I hit submit now, it is using that text, working with this tool to generate a 10 second audio clip. And uh, it's working through that. And what we're gonna get is a playable file that is a 10 second audio loop. Um, so that's, and I'm actually gonna have to, let me stop sharing. I need to reshare my screen because I did not include the, audio sharing. So let's turn that back on. Okay, we'll come back to our screen share here. And I can actually make this full screen so you can see a little bit better. But it's actually generated the audio. And now I can click play here. It's absolutely amazing. So that's generated audio. It created that soundtrack and it even did a variant. And this is really great because it's a just real quick illustration of how you can use this. And it comes with code, right? So you can oftentimes, there is a repo that's behind this that you can look at. You can understand how the code comes together. Uh, there's a lot of uh, folks that are using this Comfy UI tool to build a simple interface that gives you the basic controls that you need to run with a project. But this is a really wonderful way that you can get your hands on these open source projects and run it on your own system just to learn about what it's capable of. You don't have to have a huge data center to start playing with and learning about AI. And there's probably something really useful that you can do by putting these on your system and playing with it. But one of the other cool things about Pinocchio is that you tell it where you want it to live and you can have everything installed in one place. So as my hard drive fills up with all of the data that comes with these projects, I can really quickly go in and remove some of the largest projects if I need to go in to find space, because that will eventually become a problem for me. I've still got some room today, but there's all sorts of opportunities there for you to play with things. 
Magic Animate is uh, one that came out uh, and was was pretty popular a few weeks ago. Mirror is another one that is connected to lava. It's using the video camera and it will tell you what it sees in the screen. Then we've got Stable Diffusion. And what's really cool about this is, you know, back when I started using Stable Diffusion in 2022, well, all the way back in November, um, it was actually a pretty involved effort to get Stable Diffusion installed and download the model and get everything running locally on your system. Um, and so what's what's really cool is that now with these Pinocchio projects, they've done all the work for you. So uh, the one I just clicked on there is a, is a bad example because for some reason that project is not working. But here we can illustrate real-time stable diffusion, and these are all different options for things that I can run. So we can, uh, we'll just do a real simple, let me see if I can find a simple one to share with you. Um, I've got multiple different stable diffusions on here uh, to use XDSL Turbo. So that is a version of stable diffusion uh, that uh, runs pretty quickly. And you can type something in and it, as soon as you finish typing, it will run that through and do the next iteration. So we'll pull that one up here real quick just so you can see it. But what's what's really fantastic about this is that it takes no talent at all to be able to put these on there and start using them. It's a couple of clicks and you have readily access to it. You don't have to have a GPU for these projects. You can download these, try them out on your local system. And look, if it doesn't run to a level or speed that you like, that's okay too. You tried it, you have a better understanding of what's available and then you can, you can share it with others. Uh, they do have a discord and they've got the Twitter here. One click, you can jump in and interact with the people that are building these projects. Really recommend you go check this out. Uh, and as we're running out of time here for the broadcast, uh, we're gonna we're gonna hope it's gonna finish so I can show it to you. Uh, these are all running locally, right? And I'm also running quite a bit of CPU processing on the system for running the stream right now as well. So. It's a little slower than what I'm used to because it's having to share that CPU and GPU time across multiple different applications that I'm running. It's got the audio and the camera and the stream. So it, I've got it pretty busy right now. But uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. I think we'll have a chance to, to see this actually work. And it's got to render the, the user interface for us to load up into the browser and then I can show it to you. While I'm waiting for this to run, I see that there are a couple of you out there watching the stream live. Feel free to drop a question in the chat if you've got a question about anything I've shared today or perhaps something that's not uh, so relevant that I can speak to just while we're waiting on this to load up. It, it is uh, really so much fun to play with these things. And this is really the best part of the job, honestly, getting to learn and experiment, see the kinds of incredible projects that people are building, and then being able to share them with all of you, that is something that really excites so You can actually see my camera's a little bit delayed while it's running this. So uh, you can tell this is a live stream, right? You never know quite what you're going to get. Uh, it's part of the fun, though. Um, as it's loading up the, the elements, it's borrowing the GPU time and uh it's making my my video and probably my audio a little slow and i'll have to check the recording here when we're done see just how bad it is this may be something that I, i'm not able to do in the future but oh look we've got a url here so once again we've got uh gradio that is our interface okay now so we've got the interface up and i can i can just type something in here so a uh, sandy beach with sunset That's my keyboard messing up. A sandy beach with nope, real time with sunset in the background. And you see, it's as soon as I'm finished typing, it is trying to generate that scene. Uh, that's what's cool about XDSL Turbo. Uh, and as you change it, with a blue sky, it will re-render it, and it only takes a few seconds to render it.
back when I started using stable diffusion, we were talking about a couple of minutes to generate an image. So this just gets better and better. And what's cool about something like this is that it allows you to progressively manipulate the prompt. So this is also going to make you better at prompting. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here. And then you, there's, there's a couple of other controls here. I can have it grab an image from the uh, webcam or you can upload an image for it to start with. But Another great example of a local project, and uh, they they are even making it easier for us to take advantage of these kinds of projects by giving us examples and showing us how they're building these projects just to share them sort of as a proof of concept for us to play with. So some really cool things, running large language models and generative AI locally at home. I hope this has been interesting to you. I'm having a lot of fun doing this. And in the couple of minutes that we have left, I do want to share with you one other interesting tidbit. I think where we are in the future, look, this is going to be absolutely everywhere. Uh, it will be unavoidable. We're going to have it on every kind of the device and every kind of way. And I think we'll see these solutions are becoming integrated into devices uh, whether it's your car or, you know, your vacuum cleaner. Yes, I think that's going to be a real thing. But I also think that we're going to use these capabilities to improve the functionality of the devices and tools that we use every day. And speaking of improving things every day, I want to let you know that the online course for business pros is available. I have been working really hard to build a couple of key capabilities to share and help others learn about AI. And so I have created an online course. I've also got uh, an in-person event. If you're in DFW, check that out. That'll be uh, February 13th. You can uh, check out some tickets there and come see me. But we have an online course. I, it's called the Business Pro Master Course. And basically, it shows you all about not just using AI, but using AI to solve real problems for you, whether that's in your personal life, helping you improve your efficiency and productivity in your business and working life. There's all kinds of incredible ways to use AI, but we also want to be sure that we're not just playing with AI. We're doing something really useful, and this course is geared exactly to that. So the next cohort is going to launch in just a few days. So if that's at all interesting to you, go check it out. Drop by courses.ai-mistakes.com or drop by the website, aimistakes.com and click the order today button and it'll take you to the page. Tell you all about the course. If you're at all interested in that, just go check it out. Take a look at it. If you're not sure it's for you, feel free to grab some time with me. I've got uh, an opportunity to grab a call with me. I'd be happy to talk with you about what's available. I'm always working on the next iteration and additional options. So if you don't see something that you like, also do let me know that you're not feeling like it's for you and that you have a need for something else. I'm always looking for ways to learn about how I can help you. So let me know what you're looking for. I'm going to continue doing the online YouTube and the newsletter. None of that's going away, but I want to add more offerings that are going to help you be successful uh, that's what led me to starting the mentoring and coaching. That's also something that's available. And of course, you're watching me on one of the streaming pathways that I share with you today. I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, I look forward to all of your comments and thoughts. Share, share them with me on whatever streaming platform. We're on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook today. We'll be sharing this out over the week. And let me... Let me know your questions and comments. If you like it, give us a like, drop a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Don't feel to, don't be shy. Reach out. Let's have a conversation. I hope you're going to have a great time. Go make some mistakes.